Chapter 8. Why Decisions Disappoint. The Problem of Adaptation. While regret and opportunity costs can focus our attention on what we've passed up, there is also plenty of room for dissatisfaction with the options that we actually choose. Because of a ubiquitous feature of human psychology, very little in life turns out quite as good as we expect it will be. After much anguish, you might decide to buy a Lexus and you try to put all the attractions of other makes out of your mind. But once you are driving your new car, the experience falls just a little bit flat. You are hit with a double whammy, regret about what you didn't choose and disappointment with what you did. This ubiquitous feature of human psychology is a process known as adaptation. Simply put, we get used to things and then we start to take them for granted. My first desktop computer had 18, 8K of memory, loaded programs by cassette tape. It took five minutes to load a simple program and was anything but user friendly. I loved it and all the things it enabled me to do. Last year, I dumped a computer with several thousand times that much speed and capacity because it was too clunky to meet my needs. What I did with my computer hasn't changed all that much over the years but what i expected to do for me has when i first got cable tv i was ecstatic about the reception and excited about all the choices it provided many fewer than today now i mourn when the cable goes out and i complain about the paucity of attractive programs when it first became possible to get a wide variety of fruits and vegetables at all times of year I thought I'd found heaven. Now I take this year-round bounty for granted and get annoyed if the nectarines from Israel or Peru that I can buy in February aren't sweet and juicy. I get I got used to adapted to each of these sources of pleasure and they stopped being sources of pleasure. Because of adaptation, enthusiasm about positive experience uh, experiences doesn't sustain itself. And what's worse, people seem generally unable to anticipate that this process of adaptation will take place. The waning of pleasure or enjoyment over time always seems to come as an unpleasant surprise. Researchers have known about and studied adaptation for many years, but for the most part, they emphasized perceptual adaptation, decreased responsiveness to sights, sounds, orders, and the like as people continue to experience them. The idea is that human beings, like virtually all other animals, respond less and less to any given environmental event as the event persists. A small town resident who visits Manhattan is overwhelmed by all that is going on. A New Yorker, thoroughly adapted to the city's hyperstimulation, is oblivious to it. In the same way that we each have our own internal thermometer for registering sensation, we each have a pleasure thermometer that runs from negative and pleasant through neutral to pleasant. When we experience something good, our pleasure temperature goes up and when we experience something bad, it goes down. But when we adapt, in this case, it is hedonic adaptation or adaptation to pleasure. An experience that boosts our hedonic or pleasure temperature by say 20 degrees at the first encounter may boost it by only 15 degrees the next time, by 10 degrees in the time after that, and eventually it may stop boosting it at all. Imagine yourself out running errands on a hot, humid summer day. After several hours of sweating in the heat, you return home to your air-conditioned house. The feeling of the cool, dry air enveloping your, you is spectacular. At first, it makes you feel revived, invigorated, almost ecstatic. But as time passes, the intense pleasure wanes, replaced by a feeling of simple comfort. While you don't feel hot, sticky, and tired, you don't feel cool and energized either. In fact, you don't feel much of anything. You've gotten so accustomed to the air conditioning that you don't even notice it. That is, you don't notice it until you leave to go back out into the heat a while later. Now the heat hits you like a blast from an open oven 
and you notice the air conditioning that you no longer have. In 1973, 13% of Americans thought of air conditioning in their cars as a necessity. Today, 41% do. I know the earth is getting warmer, but the climate hasn't changed that much in 30 years. What has changed is our standard of comfort. Even though we don't expect it to happen, such adaptation to pleasure is inevitable, and it may cause more disappointment in a world of many choices than in a world of a few. Change response to a persistent event and change reference point. Hedonic adaptation can be the simple getting used to I just described, or it can be the result of a change in reference point owing to a new experience. Imagine a woman working contentedly at an interesting job for $40,000 a year. A new job opportunity arises that offers her $60,000. She switches jobs, but alas, after six months, the new company goes under. The old company is happy to take her back, so happy, in fact, that it raises her salary to $45,000. Is she happy with the raise? Will it even feel like a raise? The answer probably is no. The 60000 salary, however briefly it was available, may establish for this person a new baseline or reference point of hedonic neutrality, so that anything less is taken as a loss. Though six months earlier, a raise from 40000 to 45000 would have felt wonderful, now it feels like a cut from 60000 to 45000 we often hear people say things like, I never knew wine could taste this good, or I never knew sex could be this exciting, or I never expected to make this much money. Novelty can change someone's hedonic standards so that what was once good enough, or even better than that, no longer is. And as we'll see, adaptation can be especially disappointing when we've put much time and effort into selecting from a myriad of possibilities the items or experiences we end up adapting to. Hedonic adaptation and hedonic treadmills. In what is perhaps the most famous example of hedonic adaptation, respondents were asked to rate their happiness on a five-point scale. Some of them had won about $50,000 and a million dollar in state lotteries within the last year. Others had become paraplegic or quadriplegic as a result of accidents. Not surprisingly, the lottery winners were happier than those who had become paralyzed. What is surprising, though, is that the lottery winners were no happier than people in general. And what is even more surprising is that the accident victims, while somewhat less happy than people in general, still judge themselves to be happy. There is little doubt that if you had asked lottery winners how happy they were right after their numbers was drawn, they would have placed themselves somewhere off the charts. And if you had asked accident victims how happy they were right after they suffered their disability, they would have been as low as can be. But as time passes and the winners and the accident victims get used to their new circumstances, the hedonic thermometers in both groups begin to converge becoming much more like the population at large. I am not suggesting here that as far as subjective experience goes in the long run, there is no difference between winning a lottery and being paralyzed in an accident. But what I'm arguing is that the difference is much smaller than you would expect and much smaller than it appears to be at the moment at which these life-changing events occur. As I say, there are two reasons why these dramatic hedonic adaptations occur. First, people just get used to good or bad fortune. Second, the new standard of what's a good experience winning the lottery may make many of the ordinary pleasures of daily life, the smell of freshly brewed coffee, the new blooms and refreshing breezes of lovely spring day rather tame by comparison. And indeed, when the lottery winners were asked to rate the hedonic quality of various everyday activities, they rated them as less pressure, pleasurable than non-lottery winners did. So there is both a change response to a persistent event and a change reference level. In the case of the accident victims, there is probably still more going on. The immediate aftermath of the accident is crushing because these accident victims have lived their lives as mobile individuals and they possess none of the skills that enable 
paraplegics to negotiate in the environment. As time passes, they develop some of these skills and discover that they are not as impaired as they first thought. Beyond this, they may start paying attention to things that can be done and appreciated by people of impaired mobility that they never gave much thought to prior to their accidents. 25 years ago, economist Tibor Sitovsky explored some of the consequences of the phenomenon of adaptation in his book, The Joyless Economy. Human beings, Sitovsky said, want to experience pleasure. And when they consume, they do experience pleasure, as long as the things they consume are novel. But as people adopt, as the novelty wears off, pleasure comes to, the, to be replaced by comfort. It's a thrill to drive your new car for the first few weeks. After that, it's just comfortable. It suddenly beats the old car, but it isn't much of a kick. Comfort is nice enough, but people want pleasure, and comfort isn't pleasure. The result of having pleasure turn into comfort is disappointment, and the disappointment will be especially severe when the goods we are consuming are durable goods, such as cars, houses, stereo systems, elegant clothes, jewelry, and computers. When the brief period of real enthusiasm and pleasure wanes, People still have these things around them as a constant reminder that consumption isn't all it's cracked up to be. That expectations are not matched by reality. And as a society's affluence grows, consumption shifts increasingly to expensive durable goods with the result that disappointment with consumption increases. Faced with this inevitable disappointment, what do people do? Some simply give up the chase and stop valuing pleasure derived from things most are driven instead to pursue novelty to seek out new commodities and experiences whose pleasure potential has not been dissipated by repeated exposure in time these new commodities also will lose their intensity but people still get caught up in the chase a process that psychologists philip brickman and Donald Campbell labeled the hedonic treadmill. No matter how fast you run on this kind of machine, you still don't get anywhere. And because of adaptation, no matter how good your choices and how pleasurable the, re the results, you still end up back where you started in terms of subjective experience. Perhaps even more insidious than the hedonic treadmill is something that Daniel Kahneman calls the satisfaction treadmill. Suppose that in addition to adapting to particular objects or experiences, you also adapt to particular levels of satisfaction. In other words, suppose that with great ingenuity and effort in making decisions, you manage to keep your hedonic temperature at 20 degrees uh, plus so that you feel pretty good about life almost all the time. Is plus 20 degrees good enough? Well. It might be good enough at the beginning, but if you adapt to this particular level of happiness, then plus 20 won't feel so good after a while. Now you'll be striving to get and do things that push you to plus 30 degrees. So even if you manage to defeat or outsmart the inexorable adaptation to commodities and experiences, you still have to defeat adaptation to subjective feelings about these commodities and experiences. It's a difficult task, mispredicting satisfaction. Adaption to positive experiences would be difficult enough if we knew it was coming and prepared ourselves for it. But oddly enough, the evidence indicates that we tend to be surprised by it. In general, human beings are remarkably bad at predicting how various experiences will make them feel. Chances are that if lottery winners knew in advance just how little winning the lottery would improve their subjective well-being, they wouldn't be buying lottery tickets. Much of the research that has been done to assess the accuracy of people's predictions about their future feelings has taken this form. One group of participants is asked to imagine some event, good or bad, and then to answer questions about how that event would make them feel. A second group consisting of those who have actually experienced the event is asked 
how that event has actually made them feel. Then the predictions of the first group are compared to the experience of the second group. In one study of this type, college students in the Midwest were asked how it would feel to live in California. They judged that students who lived in California were happier with the climate and more satisfied with life as a whole than Midwesterners. They were right about the first point, but not about the second. California college students did like the climate, but they were not happier than Midwest college students. Probably what led to the Midwestern students astray is that they focused almost entirely on the weather. Just because it's sunny and warm in California, most of the time doesn't mean that students who live in California don't have problems. Boring classes, too much work, not enough money, hassles with family and friends, romantic disappointments, and so on. It may be, emerg it, it may be marginally more pleasant to be stressed and hassled on a warm sunny day than on a freezing snowy one, but not enough to make much of a difference in your outlook on life. In another study, res respondents were asked to predict how various personal and environmental changes would affect their well-being over the next decade. Individuals were asked about changes in air pollution, rainforest destruction, increased numbers of coffee shops and TV channels, decreased risk of nuclear war, increased risk of AIDS, development of chronic health conditions, changes in income, and increases in body weight. Others were asked not to predict how these changes would make them feel, but to describe how these changes had made them feel over the last decade, to the extent that they applied in each individual case. The pattern of results was clear. Those predicting expected each of the hypothetical changes, both good and bad, to have a bigger effect than was reported by those reflecting back on actually actual experience. In still another study, young college professors were asked to think about how they would feel after they were either awarded or denied tenure. They were asked to anticipate their feelings immediately after the decisions and their feelings five and ten years later. Their participants in the study were somewhat mindful of adaptation effects and accordingly they expected to be extremely happy or sad when the decision was made, but that this joy or sadness would dissipate somewhat over time. Nonetheless, they got it wrong. The predictions of these professors were compared to the experiences of faculty who had actually experienced positive or negative tenure decisions either very recently, five years before, or ten years before. Amazingly, with the passage of time, there was no difference in reported well-being between professors who had been awarded tenure and those who had been passed over for the lifetime appointment. Even with adaptation in mind, the predictors substantially overestimated how good a positive decision would make them feel and how bad a negative decision would make them feel in the long run. Admittedly, there is more to the mismatch between prediction and experience than just the failure to anticipate adaptation. We are ingenious at doing psychological repair work and finding silver linings after things go badly. My colleagues were a bore, the students were losers, the job was killing me, I worked all the time and had no life, it liberated me, I became a consultant and worked decent hours for twice the salary, but failure to anticipate adaptation is surely a part of this mismatch. People also overestimate how devastated they will be by bad health news such as a positive HIV test and they underestimate how they will adjust to severe illness. Elderly patients suffering from a variety of the most common debilitating illnesses of advanced age reliably judge the quality of their lives more positively than do the physicians who are treating them. It's easy to see how results like these would follow directly from the fact that we adapt to almost everything but ignore or underestimate adaptation effects in predicting the future. When asked to imagine being, say, 25000 per year richer, it's easy to conjure up what it will feel like at the moment you get the raise. The mistake is to assume that the way it feels at the moment is the way it will feel forever. Almost every decision we make involves a prediction about future emotional responses. When people marry, 
they are making predictions about how they will feel about their spouse. When they have children, they're making predictions about their enduring feelings about family life. When they embark on a long course of graduate or professional training, they are making predictions about how they'll feel about school and how they'll feel about work. When people move from the city to a suburb, they are making predictions about how it will feel to cut the grass and be tied to their cars. And when they buy a car or a stereo or anything else, they're predicting how it will feel to own and use that product in the months and years ahead. If people err systematically and substantially in making those predictions, it's likely that they will make some bad decisions, decisions that produce regret even when events turn out well. Adaptation on the choice problem. The abundance of choice available to us exacerbates the problem of adaptation by increasing the costs in time and effort of making a decision. Time, effort, opportunity costs, anticipated regret and the like are fixed costs that we pay upfront in making a decision and those costs then get amortized over the life of the decision. If the decision provides substantial satisfaction for a long time after it is made, the cost of making it recedes into insignificance. But if the decision provides satisfaction for only a short time, those costs loom large. Spending four months deciding what stereo to buy isn't so bad if you really enjoy that stereo for 15 years. But if you end up being excited by it for six months and then adapting, you may feel like a fool for having put in all that effort. It just wasn't worth it. So the more choices we have, the more effort goes into our decisions and the more we expect to enjoy the benefits of those decisions. Adaptation by dramatically truncating the duration of those benefits puts us into a state of mind where the result just wasn't worth the effort. The more we invest in a decision, the more we expect to realize from our investment. And adaptation makes agonizing over decisions a bad investment. It should also be obvious that the phenomenon of adaptation will have more profound effects on people who set out to maximize than it will on people who are aiming for good enough. It is maximizers for whom expanded opportunities really create a time and effort problem. It is maximizers who make a really big investment in each of their decisions, who agonize most about trade-offs. And so it is maximizers who will be most disappointed when they discover the pleasure they derive from their decisions to be short-lived. Happiness isn't everything. Subjective experience is not the only reason we have for existing. Careful, well-researched, and labor-intensive decisions may produce better objective results than impulsive decisions. A world with multiple options may make possible better objective choices than a world with few options. But at the same time, Happiness doesn't count for nothing, and subjective experience isn't trivial. If adaptation saddles people with a subjective experience of their choice that doesn't justify the effort that went into making those choices, people will begin to see choice not as a liberator, but as a burden. What is to be done? If you live in a world in which you experience misery more often than joy, adaptation is very beneficial. It may be the only thing that gives you the strength and courage to get through the day. But if you live in a world of plenty in which sources of joy outnumber sources of misery, then adaptation defeats your attempts to enjoy your good fortune. Most modern Americans live in a bountiful world. While we don't get to do and to have everything we want, no other people on earth have ever had such control over their lives such material abundance and such freedom of choice. Whereas adaptation does nothing to negate the objective improvements in our lives that all this freedom and abundance bring, it does much to negate the satisfaction we derive from those improvements. We could go a long way toward improving the experienced well-being of people in our society if we could find a way to stop the process of adaptation. But adaptation is so fundamental 
and universal feature of our responses to events in the world, it is so much a hardwired property of our nervous system that there is very little we can do to mitigate it directly. However, simply by being aware of the process we can anticipate its effects and therefore be less disappointed when it comes. This means that when we are making decisions, we should think about how each of the options we feel not just tomorrow, but months or even years later. Factoring in adaptation, factoring in adaptation to the decision-making process may make differences that seem large at the moment of choice feel much smaller. Factoring in adaptation may help us be satisfied with the choices that are good enough rather than the best and this in turn we reduce the time and effort we devote to make to making those choices finally we can remind ourselves to be grateful for what we have this may seem trite the sort of thing one hears from parents or ministers and the, and then ignores but individuals who regularly experience and express gratitude are physically healthier more optimistic about the future and feel better about their lives than those who do not Individuals who experience gratitude are more alert, enthusiastic, and energetic than those who do not, and they are more likely to achieve personal goals. And unlike adaptation, the experience of gratitude is something we can affect directly. Experiencing and expressing gratitude actually get easier with practice by causing us to focus on how much better our lives are than they could have been or were well, before the disappointment that adaptation brings in its wake can be blunted.